Okay. Welcome back <laughs> to the second session on uh, the Four Noble Truths. So, I was explaining the Four Noble Truths and uh, we have gone through the two uh, Noble Truths which uh, kind of uh, addresses the ground reality of our existence. Now, to solve that kind of uh, ground reality problem that we dwell in, that we exist in, the two later truths come into uh, picture that Buddha taught. And the two uh, later truths are the true cessation, the ceasing of suffering, and the true path. So this process, or this uh, kind of uh, presentation of the Four Noble Truths in this order, the truth of suffering, truth of origin of suffering, and truth of cessation, and truth of the path, is organized in a manner um, where it's uh, presented in a, may, in a way that it could be uh, uh, in an orderly manner to understand it and uh, apply it in life so that when we train ourselves in these uh, messages, in these uh, instructions given by the Buddha, uh, we can train in an orderly manner and then gain the realization in that orderly manner. If we look in the, this Four Noble Truth from an, another angle, uh, from the procedure or from the order of cause and effect, like uh, in every, any circumstances, causes and conditions that appear first and then it kind of produces its resultant state. If we try to present these four noble truths in that kind of uh, order and that sequence, then I should, order, I should explain the origin of suffering first and the, the suffering second. And then in, in the same way, I should also explain the path first and the cessation second. So there are these kind of different orders. The normal order that we use is uh, kind of a, a sequence, orders uh, following the sequence of how we achieve the realization through training ourselves into the uh, practice of Four Noble Truths, or the training of Four Noble Truths. So from that angle, uh, it is important to understand first the suffering. This, all, of we, all of us, we, suffer, we experience it. It's a ground reality, and it is important to understand that first. And after understanding that, then we should search for where it is coming from and then address it, then once we are kind of clear about that, then we need to address the next step. If it is possible to make the suffering cease or get rid of the suffering, so at that stage comes into the picture the cessation, the truth of cessation, a stage where the suffering is ceased and the person or the practitioner is free from the suffering. If that state is established, then there arises 
and naturally the kind of interest <laughs> to find out how can that be achieved. If there is a way that can be achieved, that that is achievable. So and that, at that level, then we come to realize there is a way, and there is a path, there is a system. If we follow them, we can achieve that cessation of suffering. The state of where the suffering has ceased. So, uh, now we are addressing the third um, truth, the truth of the cessation, a state where suffering is completely ceased. Um, we need to first think about it. Um, is it possible to be free from suffering? Is it possible there is a state that is free from suffering? If there is no possibility for at all for this state free from suffering or where suffering has ceased, then there is no hope at all to be free from suffering. We just, we know that we are suffering and we need to keep suffering. And that's, that's the only option. <coughs> so here, it's really important to establish that there is a state free from being suffering. So, how can we establish that? First thing is, suffering, as I have explained, comes from an origin, a spot of its origin, a place where it ori kind of originates, or a source of it. So, it's a very reasonable and logical approach that if something is produced by some other thing, then to seize the production of that resultant state, where we need to look at is, we need to look at that causal state, or the condition that produces it. If we can cut off that produce, and kind of that cause and condition that produces the other state, then we don't need to worry about the resultant state, because as long as the cause doesn't exist, there is no way that the resultant state can exist anymore. So, from that point of view, since we already established that the suffering is originating from the delusion and the kind of uh, negative potentials, negative and potential, kind of a positive a variety, a varieties of potentials. So, since we established that, now if we are serious about make the suffering cease, then where we need to find the solution? In these causal conditions, in the, in the delusion and uh, kind of uh, the um, potentials that produces the suffering. So, now we establish that. Once we establish that, so these are the causal states. Now we need to look here, there. If it is possible to get rid of those things. If there is no possibility at all to get rid of delusion and the potentials that produces the suffering, then surely there will be no hope. But it's not like that. Because the reason here is um, the delusion and the potentials that can produce and or condition to produce the suffering are kind of founded on uh, kind of uh, unstable base an unstable foundation, and unstable roots. They are not founded, or they are not built up on very stable and solid foundation. That is the kind of, the great kind of source of hope that we have. So, wh how to look at it? Uh, according to Buddhism, 
as I told you earlier, according to Buddhism, it's a cause and effect. Whatever has happening today around us is a resultant state of something else that happened yesterday or maybe day before yesterday, maybe a year ago, maybe uh, kind of 10 years ago, maybe 100 years ago. So whatever is happening today is at the same time our kind of <coughs> causal states or the conditions that may bring some kind of resultant state in the future. Probably it could be tomorrow, probably it could be uh, five days ago, uh, five days after, probably one week after, probably months after, or probably a year after, or maybe a hundred years after. So, the functioning of cause and effect is kind of instantly, or every moment, is there. We, we, there is no way that we can avoid it in our life. It's unavoidable. There is no, nothing that we can try to do, try to get out of it. It's just the nature. So we need to address it. Um, so if it's like that, surely all of our sufferings are related to its causes, then its causes too must, must come from some other causes. It's not that the <coughs> causes of the suffering are just the ultimate cause, final cause, and then there is no other cause, and it's coming from nothingness. It's not like that. It's a whole circle of, cycle of kind of uh, causality that is continuing. So, if it is like that, then where does the delusion come from? Where does the kind of these potentials, the karmas, come from? We need to further kind of uh, trace it. If we do this kind of research, then we will come to really uh, understand that. The delusion, in general, um, according to Buddhism, if we summarize it, it could be the kind of anger, desirous attachment, and ignorance. These are the kind of summarization of all the delusions. Now, if can be, it, if we try to further kind of uh, expound it a little bit, then there could be. Jealousy, kind of a pride based on self-aggrandizement, and there could be kind of uh, some other factors like uh, being, uh, how to say, indecisive, or then there could be some like uh, uh, wrong views. So they, it can be like further extended in that way. And then it could be further extended. Wrong views can be further categorized in five different wrong views. And uh, there is uh, other categories, other varieties of uh, kind of these uh, delusions can be further uh, kind of divided into different ways. So it keeps on multiplying like that. So the factor is here, if we summarized everything of them, it comes to Desirous attachment, hatred or anger, it falls into the same category, and the ignorance. Now, where does these come from? Surely these must come from some kind of causes, or it is kind of not uh, coming from nothingness. So, when we look at these things from that, we do an investigation in that direction, what we find is Anger and the d desirous attachment, these are kind of a byproduct or a kind of a produced by the ignorance. Now here, the ignorance has a great role to play in our life. And at the same time, we also need to know that these desirous attachment and the anger or the hatred are really kind of a those disturbing factors in our life. But in most of the time, in our daily life, we take them as something necessary, something needed. There, there are a lot of kind of psychological schools. They say, if you don't have anger, you cannot protect yourself. 
You need the anger to protect yourself. If you, do, if you don't have desirous attachment, then you could not be successful. You need desire to be successful. So, like, you know, the modern psychology looks at these things as some kind of really important emotional kind of uh, characteristic for survival, for human survival. But from the Buddhist psychological point of view, Buddhist training point of view, they look at these things from the negative side of it. So it may be appear, it may appear like for the common human being, it may appear like the modern approach is more realistic and uh, kind of more uh, soothing to them. Because we, all of we, we, we are born with these problems. They are, these are kind of, uh, to certain extent, uh, to certain extent, a natural instinct of human being. But everything natural is not necessary, have to be good. There are a lot of natural things, those are kind of bad. There are a lot of uh, poisons in the nature that can destroy a lot of things. So there are a lot of things that those exist in the nature that could be very, very destructive. So in the same way, if something is natural, if something is in the nature, it doesn't mean that it's always good. So, though we are born with these things, these natural instinct, but these are very, really harmful. If we kind of look and if we investigate thoroughly, very seriously and very kind of objectively, then we will come to understand. Unless if we are just concerned about our own kind of uh, benefit, not about uh, just that benefit also for a time being, short period benefit, then maybe it appears like, oh, this is necessary, this is really helpful. So, um, from that angle, these two kind of negative emotions, the delusive thinking, or delusive attitude of hatred and anger together and the desirous attachment is kind of produced from the ignorance. Now here, the ignorance is a very common English word, but it is employed in Tibetan Buddhism to express, or to explain something very, very unique. So, what kind of unique thing that we express to that? Ignorance here is an obsolete and wrong understanding of the truth, the reality. And this truth and reality could be a kind of ultimate subtle variety of truth and it could be a kind of a very conventional truth about the cause and effect. As long as we don't have a kind of a, we, we have obsolete and kind of wrong or misunderstood notion of uh, kind of uh, the causality, the cause and effect circle the functioning of cause and effect, there could be a lot of possibility that we can have these kind of uh, desirous attachment and the anger and such things kind of produced from it. As long as we have this misunderstood notion and obsolete understanding of uh, the ultimate truth, it will drop, definitely will produce these emotions, wrong emotions. And then these wrong, these wrong emotions will always produce further more kind of a, uh, varieties of um, negative emotions, delusion, and which will trigger our different varieties of actions from our life. Now how does it work? If someone shouts at me, I get angry. And if I get angry, probably I, will sh I shout back. And then in this process, 
as soon as I shout back, the action, the vocal action is created. So shouting back at that person surely is not a good action. And as soon as that action is completed, the action itself will last for just a short period. When I, did that, when I do that, when I shout there, but then there is a potential seed left over by that action after the action ceases. So after the action ceases, the potential will be carried over. According to Buddhism, it's, on, it's left over on the repository mind. But the repository mind yeah, is, is, could be explained in a much deeper way. So, according to Buddhist the kind of uh, dynamics of causality, dynamics of karma and its effect, the mind has a great role to play. It has, a, it has multiple roles to play. One, multi, one role out of that is it, it is the kind of repository where all the potentials are deposited. And the another role is it can activate it can, be the, it can be the main kind of uh, uh, main player, main player of doing all those actions. And another role is it can be the main sufferer and also be the main enjoyer of that, uh, those uh, resultant state of the uh, kind of those uh, karmas. So there are a lot of functioning about that. But then there are philosophical differences between philo different philosophical schools, how they present it forward. So, um, from that point of view, the ignorance, ignorance is the source of all these problems. All these kind of karmas, they are also kind of uh, traced back from the ignorance. All the delusion, the negative emotions, when we kind of trace them, we investigate them, they are also traced to put that point, the ignorance. Now what is this ignorance? As I told you earlier, it's the ignorance, an obsolete knowledge of the ultimate truth and a kind of a, a misunderstood notion of the ultimate truth. So, how does it work? Just use some analogy from our life, real life. If, if infant kids don't know that by touching the fire, they can get their finger burned. So, not knowing by touching fire, they will get burned is an ignorance. Now, under that influence of that ignorance, they go and touch fire. What happens? They end up in burning their hand. So this is a kind of very commonly understandable resultant state. So in the similar way, as long as we have, now there is another way of putting it. Now, uh, by not knowing the way that something is harmful to someone's health, people end up doing so. That then sometimes, even if something is harmful to their health, they misunderstand that and they feel that or they, under, they misunderstand it as it is helpful to their health. They end up in eating those things. And if they do that, as a result of that, they suffer. So this is how the ignorance plays a role in our life. So the ignorance have two different meanings, two different levels of meaning. Not understanding the thing in the way it is, or understanding the thing in obsolete or wrong way. So this is two different meaning of the uh, ignorance. But according to the deeper level of Buddhist philosophy, the second variety of understanding, a misunderstanding, or understanding in a wrong way, the truth, is the kind of... Uh, much more kind of powerful way of presenting the ignorance. So, so for that reason, now what, what we do is here, since ignorance is baseless, 
It's just a kind of a wrong knowledge. It's just obsolete knowledge. If something is white, ignorance is thinking it's black. If something is black, ignorance is understanding it is white. So that kind of mentality is baseless. It doesn't have any kind of solid foundation for its kind of uh, sustenance or in its support. It's, it's against the truth. It's against the reality. So it's baseless. So if it is baseless, then it's sure that there could be a remedy for that. It's as natural what happens. If something is based on some kind of good solid foundation, then it cannot be shaken very easily. If someone is kind of built on, kind of, in the Western expression, you have a castle on the air. If you try to build a castle on the air, that cannot last at all. You cannot expect it to last forever. So, ignorance is the foundation of hatred, anger, and desirous attachment, and all the different varieties of delusion. So all the different varieties of delusions are like castles built on the air. So there is no stable and good foundation underneath that. Now, if it is like that, then we look opposite of that direction. Now, what can be done? Is there a way to encounter those things? Surely, there will be the way. If we understand the truth, if we comprehend the truth, the ultimate truth, ultimate reality, then all those kind of, uh, how to say, elaborations, those are produced under the misunderstood or obsolete understanding of the ultimate truth will completely get kind of wiped away. So, so this is the kind of ground reality this is the kind of uh, down-to-earth solid reality that makes us confident about, oh, there is a possibility to kind of, uh, there is a possibility to make the suffering cease because its causes and conditions can be stopped. Because the root cause of all of them is ignorance and it can be get rid of through the process of learning and acquiring knowledge and wisdom of the ultimate truth. So it gives us a kind of very clear picture for there is a possibility that a, a state where the suffering has completely ceased is possible. Now if that is possible, if there is a way how to achieve it, comes the next level of question. It's quite natural to the human being. So we are intellectual human beings, kind of uh, inter uh, intellectual beings, uh, kind of uh, most intelligent beings compared to the other people. So it becomes like that. It comes, uh, can, uh, goes in that um, uh, kind of a step. When we enter into that step, then comes into the picture. Now, if the cessation of suffering, a state where suffering has completely ceased, appears achievable in this reasoning, through this logical reasoning, now, how can it be done in a practical manner? What could be the step-by-step -step things that we need to follow? There should be an order, there should be a sequence. It cannot be like, uh, you know, we cannot keep jumping and hopping from one place to another. So then here comes into the picture the Eightfold Noble Path. According to the general common Buddhism, it's the Eightfold Noble Path. But then, according to the uh, kind of uh, Mahayana Buddhism, it's the uh, kind of a twofold approach. The method aspect of the path and the wisdom aspect of the path. So since I'm doing a kind of separate uh, 
kind of a session on eightfold number path, we are going to stick, skip that. So we just just spoken on a kind of a twofold approach of the path. The twofold approach of the path is the method or aspect of the path and the kind of wisdom aspect of the path. Now, in our life, um, whatever we do, we need to understand things. We need to clear about the concept. We need to have knowledge about that. So this is one portion of it, the life that we live. At the same time, we need to, we need to have a lot of methods to apply those knowledges. A lot of methods, skillful methods, to apply those knowledges properly, and then we can get to that uh, resultant state. In the similar way, when we look forward to make our life happier, we also need to do that in a kind of a, uh, more spiritual manner. So, according to the Mahayana Buddhism, the method aspect of the path have a, its own benefit that is mainly, according to Mahayana Buddhism, we, say, we talk about two collections or two accumulations. And the two accumulations are the merit accumulation and the accumulation of wisdom. Merit and wisdom in the Mahayana path, we always separate it. We always kind of uh, explain distinctly from each other. So most of those activities, most of those physical, vocal, and mental activities that we do in order to acquire the merit is considered the method aspect of the path. And most of those activities that we do to acquire wisdom, higher level of, kind of comprehension and the knowledge of uh, things, those are kind of uh, classified as the wisdom aspect of the path. So, to train ourselves well in the method, of, method aspect of the path, we have the training into, according to general Buddhism, taking refuge into triple, triple gem. And then, after that, like uh, looking forward to cultivate the renunciation, a, a kind of genuine and, uh, how to say, instantaneous sense of willingness to liberate oneself from the samsara or the suffering. And then, if you go furthermore, then generating the bodhicitta, the generating the compassion, great compassion, a sense of care from the depth of one's heart towards all the sentient beings. And then next step is to generate the bodhicitta, a strong sense of instantaneous innate willingness to achieve the Buddhahood just for the benefit of others. Then, further, we should train in the different varieties of moral practices, like spiritual practices, like uh, generosity, doing charities from now and then, every time, whenever there is a possibility, doing the practice of charity, giving the necessary kind of supply or the things to those people who need those things, who are lacking those things, who are badly in need of those things. One way of doing the practice of generosity and charity. And then living a morally correct and right life. There are different kind of moral, con moral precepts that can be uh, kind of uh, 
learned and that can be lived with. Like in general, according to Buddhism, not killing, especially uh, like we have five precepts. These five precepts are not killing a human being and not stealing the belongings of a human being and not doing any kind of sexual misconduct, having any kind of sexual relationship outside the circle of one's marriage relationship and uh, not kind of uh, cheating in a very, very kind of, uh, uh, how to say, serious manner in a spiritual field. And then finally, not usage of alcohol in, your, in one's life, not consumption of alcohol. So these are five precepts. People need to train in these things. But beside that, we also have ten major downfalls that the people should avoid or kind of uh, getting engaged in those things. If I count ten major downfalls, then that could be a little different than that. Ten major downfalls could be avoid killing. It doesn't say that avoid killing human beings. It is very general. Avoid killing means avoid killing. But when it comes to five percepts, it's avoid killing human beings. So this is a different way of looking at it. And then, like, uh, avoid having sexual misconduct, it's same, it applies in the same way. And then avoid saying, telling lie. It could be any kind of lie, including the major variety of lie. And uh, and yeah, that's right. And then avoid, avoid stealing. So there are three that can be committed through the body, usage of body, killing any living being and stealing anyone's property or anyone's belongings and then committing sexual misconduct. These are the three from body. And then with the speech, um, avoid telling lie and then avoid causing separation in between different groups and brothers and friends and kind of uh, communities and nations that kind of uh, kind of uh, vocal action and then avoid saying any kind of harsh word kind of uh, uh, any kind of insultful word and then avoid uh, kind of meaningless idle gossiping. So these are the four. And then there are kind of a, a very shrewd sense of, um, very shrewd sense of uh, desire to uh, get other person's belongings to oneself. It's a kind of just mental. We, uh, one should avoid that. And then a wish to help harm other, any kind of wish to harm other. It could be any kind of living being. That's a mental action. And then wrong view. The wrong view uh, could be explained in much further more details. Like generally we can say believing that the Buddha Dhamma and Sangha doesn't exist. Believing that the, the law of causality or the dynamics of causality doesn't exist. It's just random. It comes from any nothingness. That kind of belief system. Like cause and effects are not related to each other. Anything can arise from anything else. Or good can come from bad. Bad can come from good. That kind of belief system. And also the kind of... Uh, obsolete understanding of the ultimate nature, ultimate truth. So, the, these three, kind of latest one, are just mental actions. As soon as you have that manifested in your mind, you have that arising in your mind, the action is over. 
So these are kind of something that we need to be cautious about. But the other are kind of more physical and vocal. Even if you have some kind of uh, intention inside there, as long as you didn't do it physically and vocally, you didn't commit the action. So that's a different one. So there are kind of these Buddhist ethics that we need to train in. And then, more than a Buddhist ethics, these are just kind of human values. It's kind of universal to human beings all over the world. To if we live with these values, this could contribute a lot to have a safer society, to have a better community, to have a good kind of a, uh, friendship in between the community and so on. So it's a human value rather than a Buddhist ethic. So it's really important to have these values in the life. If we live with that, then we are living a morally correct lifestyle. And then it's really important to have the practice of patience done. Practice of patience is one of the kind of uh, saintly attitudes. The patience is a kind of a great practice that can be done to do and of uh, how to say practice of patience very seriously with the deep sense of kind of a, a confidence in that people need to be very brave. Only brave can do that. It's not a kind of a work of a coward that can do it. So practice of patience is really important. And then the practice of, you know, uh, we say diligence. and kind of uh, hard working, be diligent in spiritual practice, spiritual values, in spiritual kind of uh, uh, efforts or spiritual uh, training, not being diligent about like, you know, declaring a war or someone or not being declaring uh, kind of diligent about like abusing someone or kind of uh, uh, creating problems for someone. If we uh, work hard to do that, then that's a kind of a completely wrong. We need to be diligent in the right direction and in the right positive direction. So that is it. And then we need to train ourselves in the concentration. Now these two factors, the last two things, the concentration and the wisdom, these are really important in order to achieve the liberation. If our purpose and goal is to achieve certain higher level of benefit, not to that final level of benefit, to get to the liberation, then concentration and wisdom could be really helpful to have, but not the extremely necessary thing in general. But to train yourself well in charity, you need to understand the charity. And to understand the charity, how to do it, you need a wisdom, a variety of wisdom. And to train yourself well into the morality, you need a variety of wisdom, unless you cannot train yourself, unless you will never understand it. If you don't understand the morality, what is the perfect moral way of living, you will never train yourself well in that. Now, if you don't understand the patience and the diligence, how to do it, how to train yourself in it, you can never do that. So, Involvement of wisdom is always there. So for that reason, wisdom is taken as an I. It is kind of used. I is used as a kind of a analogy to explain the wisdom in the kind of ancient text. Without I, even though we have other organs, things cannot be that clear. The I have great advantage compared to the other organs other sense organs that we use. In the same way, wisdom is almost like I to rest of those uh, six perfections. The concentration is very important. Unless we have concentration, there is no way that we can achieve the liberation. 
we need to concentrate the mind and focus on something else and we need to generate and then develop that capability to focus our mind. So this is how, like according to Buddhist tradition, in which values we need to train in. So if we try to kind of, uh, how to say, summarize whole path, then we can say the path of six perfection. Out of six perfection, all these five generosity, morality, patience, diligence, and concentration. These are grouped in one section named method aspect of the path. And it further includes the bodhicitta, renunciation, the practice of refuge, and a lot of those things, which mainly focuses on accumulating more merit. Then the wisdom is separate from there, which is the main area where we can acquire more knowledge, greater comprehension, in-depth understanding, and the wisdom. That is how we look at it. So these two very important wings, very important kind of aspects of the path are explained in the Mahayana Buddhist teachings as the two wings of a bird. If a bird doesn't have one wing, the bird cannot fly. So a bird needs the two wings to fly smoothly. In the same way, a practitioner, to sail smoothly in their path, they need these two aspects of the path to be trained well. So, now to move forward with the wisdom aspect, because we need to address it. The real, you know, the real weapon, the real weapon against the problem of the ignorance is the wisdom. It's not the uh, kind of uh, method aspect of the path. Method aspect of the path is supporting supplementary factor. So the real weapon that we use to tackle the problem of the samsaric existence or the suffering of the samsara is the wisdom aspect of the path. So how to do that? And what is that? And how to gain it? This is a kind of a very important area and it's a very profound area too. So according to Buddhism, the basic Buddhist philosophy is the philosophy of selflessness. Now this self, we don't use it in the context of like a saying like selfless, he, he's providing a selfless service to someone else, like that kind of context. That's a different way. That means someone is kind of ignoring their own benefit to serve someone else. That's a different way of looking at it. The selflessness here, here is a very different con kind of a concept of the self selflessness. So, according to Buddhism, uh, we use the word self. Um, in explain a lot of things. In general, the approach is, according to my understanding, the general approach is, um, whenever we refer to us, we say self. It's very common. I, self, or me. Now, how do we perceive this I, self, and me? This is a really important question here. It is needed to be addressed by everyone. We look at ourselves, something very important, very solid, uh, very independently existing, um, kind of like uh, with a lot of characteristics, kind of fictitious characteristics or fictitious qualities that we add up. <coughs> just for an investigation. 
just take some real life examples. If there is a kind of man who, speak, who feels he's extremely smart man, if suddenly he's shouted by someone else, stupid against him, what kind of feeling he could be having? Surely very, very kind of a distinct, very kind of, a, how to say, uh, disturbing feeling that, may, that man may have. Now, in the other side, if there is, a, there is a woman who feels she's most beautiful, and then suddenly, if someone shouts at her, what a bad looking woman is that? So what kind of reaction could be? Could be very, very kind of uh, upset. So these kind of reactions, there could be a lot of such things. So these, in many occasions, we express, we explain it like uh, our weakness. Say, that is my weakness, that is his weakness, or it, our weakness. So, how does it work? It's really important to understand. Look into our kind of, uh, look into our, how to say, psychological uh, structure and functioning. As long as we don't have that feeling, as long as I feel I'm not a smart guy, even if another person shouts at me, Stupid. It doesn't make that much of difference. Then as long as the woman doesn't have that feeling, I'm a very beautiful woman. Other ones uh, shouts at her, an ugly woman. It doesn't make that much of difference. So there is a kind of, uh, you know, the functioning, psychological functioning within us that, that creates a whole lot of kind of this, uh, uh, how to say, uh, fictitious, characteristics and uh, qualities, it adds up on us. There is a huge exaggeration that we live with that. So, according to Buddhism, we live in a world of kind of, a, how to say, projected projections. Where we project a lot of qualities of us through the exaggeration. We try to, we, we remain quite far away from real kind of uh, uh, objective approach. So, so what happens? Um, when such thing happens, like uh, when I have this feeling, I'm very smart, we, I have this feeling with this, I'm very smart, that something of kind of smart quality and characteristic is kind of uh, inherently built up within myself. That is a kind of very common feeling that we create. That is an exaggeration, but that we create, we live with those things. Not just an example. We go to more kind of, uh, you know, uh, understandable examples. Let me talk, let's talk about the concept of the beauty. If it's like uh, the teenagers in the 18th and 19th, when the young two teenagers get uh, kind of attracted to each other, it may appear like there is no other kind of more beautiful woman than this one in front of me. And the man, the boy may also, the, the girl may also think, oh, this is the kind of smartest guy in front of me. There could not be anything smarter than that. And it's all delusional. It's all illusion. After two days, if they have a big fight, then the, when, then the girl looks at the man, she may feel, what a disgusting man is in front of me. I don't like to look at him. Isn't it? And the man will be doing the same thing. <clears throat> what a 
disgusting woman is in front of me. I don't like to look at you. <laughs> like that. So, where does the attraction vent? But at that moment when they are attracted to each other, it appears like the attraction, the source of attraction is somewhere there inside that object, not in their brain. That is how we are kind of living a fictitious life. And this is kind of a very, very, how to say, visible and uh, vivid one that I'm presenting in, to you. But most of our things that we live in our life are like that. But the, the, the kind of, uh, the clarity may be at a different level, at different stages. So, um, from that point of view, from that boy's point of view, like, while he is attracted, it feels like the, the, the source of attraction, the beauty is something, something within that object, not in his brain, you know, is within that object. From the girl's point of view also, it appears like the, the, the smartness, the kind of quality of smartness is something within that boy. It is not in her brain or somewhere else. So this is the exa exaggeration that we are living. In the same way, when we look at ourselves, everyone feels that I'm good. At certain level, at certain point of life. No one likes to hear anything bad about self. So it shows that there is a fictitious building up of these qualities and characteristics around us. So, this fictitious qualities and characteristics that we build around us is also named self, according to Buddhism. It's very interesting. As soon as we focus on self, it automatically comes with that. So we need to really differentiate here too. The two different varieties of self. A self as an object and self as a kind of adjective that we add up. Self as a noun, self who eats, self who drinks, self who sleeps. There's that kind of object, self. That's a noun. That's an object. Now there's another self that we created around it. It's all those adjective qualities and characteristics that we build up on it. Like everyone feels like, I'm good. Or most of the time we feel like, I'm best. It's, it's natural. But it's not good, it's not right, it's not truth. So, so the thing is, the self that we negate, we say selflessness. The, negate, the self that we negate is this self that we the add a characteristic, not the one that is suffering, not the one that is enjoying. We do exist, we do, we do agree the existence of the self human being who is suffering, who is enjoying, who could be kind of uh, jumping, who could be falling, who could be uh, running, but we don't, ex we don't agree with the existence of this self with this kind of fictitious characteristics. And this whole lot of fictitious characteristics and values that we add up is also referred as self in the text. So this is, in the other word, we say self as an object of negation that we negate on it. So this is the self when we say selfless. When we when we put forward the idea non-existence of the self. When we put forward the idea absence of the self. So now where does it come from? Why 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 it is related? Why why what does it how does it relate to each other? Whatever we do, wrong in our life, it is done in done under the influence of this, you know, adding up of all these fictitious kind of uh, uh, qualities and characteristics around us. If I feel I can write a very good letter, I write that, and after someone sees that, someone says that, oh, this is wrong. I cannot. I cannot. I can bear it. So I have this fictitious characteristic added up on myself. I cannot see the truth.
because of this, you know, curtain, because of this projection I have put in forward of me. So the thing is, this projection always keeps us away from the truth. So it shows us the things in a wrong way. It presents us everything that is surrounding us in a wrong way. So, for that reason, this is really 